Then now we're talking about the nephron transport physiology and each one of those uh, colors representing a cell of the um, renal tubule. So for example, the proximal convoluted tubule over here, uh, it has two surfaces, the basolateral membrane and the apical membrane. And if we take a look at this uh, image that we saw earlier, this is it. So we know that this is the proximal convoluted tubule. And if we delete all of this, what we are talking about is this cell over here. It has two surfaces, uh, one that is um, the basolateral and it's um, close to the blood vessel. Okay, let me choose this one because there's already a blood vessel over here. So we're talking, well, we're talking about any um, um, cell, of course, if it's, whether it's this one or this one, but this one is easier for me to draw because I have the blood vessel over here. So this is the basal lateral surface because it's um, close to the blood vessel. So here um, uh, we get the secretions and also the reabsorptions um, into the blood vessel. And this is the apical um, surface and it means that the urine is passing over here. So um, the cell is either um, excreting its content into the urine or just reabsorbing from the urine. So this is the cell that I, we're talking about. That's the proximal tubule, tubule, tubule cell. And um, uh, then we know that this tubule is going to um, attach to different parts. In each one of those parts, we're going to talk about its cells. So for the proximal convenient tubule, for example, um, this color, okay. So um, first we have um, the basal lateral membrane that is um, um, close to the blood where, um, so over here we have blood, okay. And we have the main channel that is taking sodium from inside the cell to the blood, into the blood. So we are reabsorbing sodium into the blood and we're using ATP for that. So that requires energy. Uh, which means because we're taking um, sodium from inside the cell to the outside, that means we are decreasing the amount of sodium within that cell. So because we are decreasing that amount, that makes us need more sodium to come in to compensate for the reabsorption of um, sodium. So that brings us to the second channel um, that takes sodium from the urine into the cell. And then, uh, of course, it's attached with another molecule that is taking into the cell with sodium, that is a glucose. And of course, as we see here, there is a protein, but this protein does not require ATP as we have seen here. So this does not require energy. Um, this co-transport takes sodium to the inside plus glucose to the inside. And um, well, um, we have another channel here um okay oh that's important so uh because we said that we're taking sodium to the into the blood and that's in exchange what well, with the use of atp but in exchange for two potassium so now we are increasing the intracellular potassium uh, which means that we need to get rid of that big amount of potassium over here so we use this channel that takes the potassium to the outside okay and takes with it chloride from the inside into the blood over here so um because um we are taking chloride to the outside that means its amount is decreasing intracellularly so that means we need to bring chloride again into the cell from the urine because we have um, kind of uh, emptied the cell from the uh, chloride to the outside so we're taking chloride now again into the cell in exchange for that we are giving the urine a base a base means an anion so it's something that has a negative charge and these anions may include um, hydroxide or uh, formate oxalate sulfate or um, um, secreted by proximal conduit to uh, link to chloride. Well, all of these bases, um, they are secreted into the urine. So if you see this arrow, then it's into the urine, but in exchange for chloride, as we said. So that's for the channel, the other channel that we have. And because now we have um, some charge difference between the urine and the intracellular place and then the blood, we have some form of simple diffusion that some 
um, H2O and NaCl, they move into the blood, but actually not connected to a transporter protein. They just go there by simple diffusion. So that's how that's another way that allows us to take hydrogen into the blood again. Uh, I mean, um, H2O into the blood again. That is um, water. Uh, for something else that we have is um, we know that hydro we know that generally um, the hydrogen ions and the HCO3 uh, um, um, bicarbonate are the two responsible stuff for the balancing of acid base physiology between the blood and the urine and everything and we know for sure that urine is acidic while um, we need to keep the intracellular part of the cell over here to be kind of basic okay so um, what we have is uh, as we said that we are um, taking okay over here taking um, sodium into the cell and then secreting hydrogen um, in exchange because um, we need sodium we have reduced the amount of sodium first when we've taken it to the outside then we need more sodium to come in so it comes in two pathways first in addition with glucose over here and second uh, just by adding um, sodium to the inside and exchanging that for hydrogen ions so when hydrogen goes to the urine it finds within the urine the HCO3 that is the bicarbonate and that's um, um, a reaction that can occur um, fast using the carbonic anhydrase which makes the hydrogen attaches it with HCO3 and then the um, result will also become again co2 and h2o and both of these co2 and h2o are able to be reabsorbed into the cell and then over here they also meet the carbonic anhydrase enzyme and then they also make this result then this result is going to be apart into two main pieces the hydrogen that is going to be secreted again to the outside to the urine and the hco3 the bicarbonate that is going to be reabsorbed into the blood in addition to sodium with it so um that's basically all of the um, important channels that we have over here uh what we know is that the proximal community of you we are supposed to take a hundred percent of the filtered glucose and amino acids and of course we take the amino acids in addition with um sodium and uh, that allows us to um take up all of the um, most important uh, filtrates and not let them be excreted in the urine. So in the early dust, um, in the early proximal conveyor tubule, uh, it contains it contains brush borders, uh, it which reabsorbs all the glucose and amino acids and most of the um, HCO3 bicarbonate and sodium chloride, phosphate, potassium, and H2O with uric acid. So this is isotonic absorption, so there is no much change of that. Well, we have noticed here, whenever we take a positive charge, or we actually replace it with another positive charge. So that's why it's isotonic. And the same thing applies for a negative charge and, and the other negative charge. So what we're taking, we're actually replacing by the same charge. So this part of the um, um, renal tubule, that's a proximal cognitive tubule, has the ability to generate and secrete uh, ammonia. So this ammonia enables the kidneys to secrete more hydrogen in order to make the urine more acidic because we know the nature of the urine is basically, um, or actually, I mean, uh, is actually um, acidic. So um, the production of ammonia by the proximal cavity fuel makes us able to secrete more hydrogen just by attaching this hydrogen to the NH3, which leads to uh, ammonium and H4, and this NH4 is actually an acid that can be secreted into the urine. So we know also here that the parathyroid hormone uh, works on the proximal cavity tubule and it inhibits the sodium phosphate um, co-transport, and that leads to an increase in the phospho phosphate secretion. It makes sense because we know that the, the parathyroid hormone works on two parts, the calcium 
and the um, uh, phosphate part. So it makes sense to be working on um, the excretion of uh, uh, phosphate. The other um, hormone that works here is the angiotensin 2, but this time it stimulates the sodium hydrogen exchange, uh, which leads to an increase in sodium H2O and um, HCO3 reabsorption. And that's true because we know the angiotensin works on a blood pressure. So of course, whenever it takes sodium to the to the blood, like it takes sodium back to the blood, then H2O will follow. Whatever sodium goes, then H2O will follow it. So if we are reabsorbing sodium, then we are definitely reabsorbing hydrogen um, H2O with it. Um, and because this is happening due to angiotensin um, 2, that means we are permitting contraction of chalosis. And in proximal conditional um we are reabsorbing um, 65 to 80% of the filtered sodium and H2O. Um, the other part that we will be talking about is the thin descending loop of Henle. Um, this basilar absorbs um, H2O without like transported proteins. So if we take a look over here, so we're supposed to have a glomerulus over here, then um, afferent arteriole, and then efferent arteriole, and then we have the bone marrow space over here. Yeah, so we have proximal convenience. So this is the bone marrow space surrounding the glomerulus and we have the Bowman space and then we have the um, um, straight piece as far as I remember I think and then over here what we have is the um, um, yeah this is the straight piece there you go and then we have this long thing is the loop of Henley and the loop of Henley is uh, divided into two main parts so let me delete it and row two parts. This is part one. This is the thin descending loop of Henley and this is what we are going to talk about right now. The other part is the uh, thin ascending loop of Henley and then attached to the thick ascending loop of Henley which is also attached to the um, uh, distal convoluted tubule and then the collecting duct. Okay, so um, our main concern over here that we're talking about is um, the thin descending loop of Henle. So it's the one that is going down. Um, what happens here is, as we can tell, uh, we are reabsorbing um, H2O, but actually without transporter proteins, we don't need those because um, this uh, water is going to be reabsorbed passively without. Um, any transporters or without even um, energy and stuff like these. And that mechanism is called medullary hyperkinicity, um, it, which makes it impermeable to sodium, but it's permeable to hydrogen. Uh, that's why it's considered constricting sigma. So basically what is happening here is we know that this, okay, let me delete these, there you go. So we're talking about this part, as we said. So we know that this part is only a small part of the um, nephron and the kidney has like millions of nephrons. That's M, millions. Okay, so millions of nephrons. Um, these nephrons all exist within the interstitium of the um, kidney. So the interstitium of the kidney is um, divided into parts. So mainly we have the cortex and the medulla. So this medulla has an outer part and an inner part. Each one or each part of those has its own osmolality. So um, the cortex has, for example, an osmolality of um, 300. And then the outer medulla has an osmolality of 600. Then the inner medulla has its own osmolality of um, 1,200. So this difference of osmolality between each piece or each part of the kidney would make the diffusion of the water make sense because um, what we have inside this blue tubule is actually urine and we know that okay so we have urine over here so 
the urine at first has an osmolality of 300, okay? And in the cortex, it's completely equal to the um, osmolality of the cortex, so it's fine. But then um, this urine is going to flow down over here. So whenever it flows down, it is still has the osmolality of 300. But guess what? Now it's flowing within a different osmolality. It's now flowing within a 600 um, uh, osmolality. That means the high, the, the, like the outer medulla that has a higher osmolality uh, will be able to absorb water out of the urine. So it will take this water out of the urine into um, the interstitium or into the blood vessels or whatever it is. But the, the main concern is that it is taking water by um, passively uh, out of the urine. That's why it's called concentrating segments. So it's taking water out of the urine. So it's concentrating the amount of urine. And when urine gets to this place, when it reaches over here, okay, it will has an osmolality because it's been concentrated. Um, I mean, war was, was um, being absorbed out of it. So it has a new osmolality of 100, uh, 1020. And guess what? It's exactly the same as the osmolality of the inner medulla. So now there is no reabsorption again of um, hydrogen. Uh, of H2O, I always call it hydrogen, but actually H2O, that is water. So now we don't have an absorption of water. And then, of course, if it keeps flowing upward, then it will also face a different osmolality. That's where we were taking um, sodium chloride. Anyway, that's what is meant by the medullary hypertonicity. So um, this is what makes urine hypertonic, which means it has... Um, um, a higher osmolality, as we have seen over here, and then it means it has a higher oncotic pressure. So uh, that's for the thin descending group of Henle. Now we're going to talk about this part. This part is the thin um, descending. Oh, we're actually not talking about the thin descending group now. We are going to talk about the thick ascending loop of Henle. So this is thin, as you can tell, and this is thick. So talking about the thick ascending loop of, uh, limb of loop of Henle, it also has two, um, two membranes. This one is close to the blood. So here are the blood vessels that are going to reabsorb stuff from the urine. And here is we have the urine side. So uh, first we have the main channel that is taking sodium back into the blood and excreting potassium instead. So what is happening is because we're taking sodium outside of the cell into the blood, then we have less concentration of sodium within the cell, which means that this will facilitate or um, helps us bring more sodium from the urine into the cell. And of course, it will also bring potassium inside the cell and then two chloride molecules into the cell. Um, well, uh, now because we have a Potassium from here, so this is one, um, it means we are increasing the potassium, and also this is potassium too, so we are also increasing the amount of potassium inside the cell, then we need to get rid of it. So whenever we get rid of it, it's either it, one in um, two ways. First, we get rid of it into the blood, that is, I mean, with um, chloride, Without a molecule, without um, um, a protein mo molecule, it's fine. It can just live on its own by diffusion down the electrochemical gradient. So it's depending about um, the gradient that this um, charge creates. But so the electrical and the chemical is like the concentration of these chemicals on both sides of the membrane. So we are now sending potassium back into the blood and at the same time, if, due to the positive potential, we are just pushing potassium outside into the urine as well. So um, now because potassium starts to go outside, it will create the positive potential that will help both magnesium and calcium to flow by simple diffusion into the blood again. So that's not going within the cell. 
but going paracellularly and it's driven by the positive charge in the lumen of nephron so this is the lumen of the nephron and this is where urine is now it starts to have a higher positive potential because potassium is going aside so it will help both magnesium and calcium over here to go into the blood again so uh, if you read this then the thick ascending group of henley um reabsorbs sodium potassium and chloride and this is what we have seen over here okay um and it indirectly uh, induces paracellular this is the part that we're talking about the magnesium and calcium so it in, indirectly induces paracellular reabsorption of magnesium and calcium through the positive lumen potential generated by potassium back leak so because we said that potassium is now going to back leak we have taken it first taken it from the urine into the cell and then it back leaks into the urine again so um this is it uh well this part um is impermeable to uh water it does not allow um h2o to be um withdrawn or given or whatever uh this um, part makes urine less concentrated um because it does not allow um the interstitium of the um, kidneys as we said over here it does not allow it to reabsorb water anymore okay that's why it's um it makes urine less concentrated as it ascends uh, and over here we are reabsorbing 10 to 20 percent of the sodium okay uh, for the other or the next part of the renal tubule that is the distal conduit tubule um, we also have the basal lateral membrane here is the interstitium of the kidney and here is the um, apical membrane where uh, urine is so we have urine over here so first of course we have this channel that is taking sodium into the interstitium or into the blood and using ATP and then pushing potassium into the cell of the tubule itself. So uh, because we are taking sodium out, then we are reducing the concentration of the sodium within the cell, which allows us now to bring more sodium from the urine into the cell. And of course, it does not come alone. It takes with it chloride into the cell, okay? And now because we have chloride into the cell, we are able to give it back to the blood through the chloride channel diffusion okay so now the blood that has entered uh, the chloride that has entered from the urine into the cell flows within the cell and goes back into the interstitium so um now uh we are going to have also um a, a diffusion of calcium over here and then magnesium over here so they they increase in concentration within um the cell over here so we can actually reabsorb uh, calcium into the interstitium by giving it um, by giving the cell more sodium so um whatever we are taking inside of the cell we are giving it to the other side of the cell um and yeah uh well here where um the thiazide diuretics work uh if we read this then it says that the early so this is the early piece of the distal conduit tubule not the whole distal conduit tube so um this early piece it reabsorbs sodium chloride and it's impermeable to water so it doesn't allow water to pass through so uh, this makes the the urine um fully uh dilute so it's hypotonic so it makes sense because uh, in the collecting duct, uh, I mean, in the distal conduit tubule, we are really close to the ureters and then we need the urine to go outside the body. And we know that the texture of urine is actually liquid. It's just fluid. So if we are reabsorbing more water into the blood or into the interstitium, that means we're concentrating water. And that's something that we don't want to. We want the urine to flow as watery as possible so now we are not reabsorbing water anymore it's impermeable to water so that the urine can go um your um watery so uh, over here um the parathyroid hormone works 
and this is it this is the parathyroid hormone and it finds its um, receptor on this side of the um, cell uh, and it will help in increasing the calcium sodium exchange which helps in increasing this calcium reabsorption so uh, when whenever uh, parathyroid hormone works on this receptor it will help this channel to um, be stimulated and now we can reabsorb more calcium into the blood and interstitium and we know that because the parathyroid hormone works on phosphate and calcium so over here in the early from the tubule we are able to absorb five to ten percent of the sodium and um, now moving to the collecting tubule so in the collecting tubule uh first we have our well we have three main um, types of cells within the collecting tubule itself we have the principal cells we have the alpha integrated cells and beta integrated cells so mainly we're talking now about the principal cells uh, we have our very well known channel that takes sodium into the blood again um, it needs sodium and it uses atp it uses energy and then it gives instead some potassium so of course that will reduce the amount of sodium within the cell which allow us now to have more sodium flow from the urine into the cell through a unique channel called enac which means epithelial sodium channel well the main a hormone that works on this enac or actually stimulate its existence is aldosterone over here so through this sodium um, channel or through this epithelial sodium channel it will allow more sodium to flow into um, the cell so uh, and because of course we have brought some potassium from blood into the cell then this potassium of course is going to leave the cell into the urine over here so we are kind of secreting potassium over here and um, of course we also have a place where the adh that is the antidiuretic hormone work um, it works over here on the principal cells on a receptor called v2 receptor and this v2 will help in increasing the expression of aquaporins these aquaporins are the channels that will allow water to flow back into the cell then into the blood so it will just reabsorb just a little bit more uh, water um, what we have here is that as well um, the aldosterone works it works on the principal cells and on the alpha integrated cells um, and we said that aldosterone in addition to that has has um, some unique effect on the ENAC uh, just to remember and over here we have the hydrogen ions are going to be secreted into the urine and uh, we are uh, well secreting um, hydrogen ions either in exchange for potassium or just on their own and if we read the rest of the page it says in the collecting tubule we are reabsorbing sodium in exchange for or secreting potassium and hydrogen it makes sense because we are taking um sodium over here into the cell and then there you go we are secreting hydrogen over here and then over here of course uh and also we are secreting potassium to the outside over here so we're taking sodium and we're secreting potassium and secreting hydrogen as well um and the whole process is regulated by aldosterone so this is what aldosterone works what it does it helps in um secreting potassium and also secreting hydrogen ions and at the same time it works on the um epithelial sodium channels that will allow us to reabsorb more sodium into the blood from the urine okay um, so it says that aldosterone, aldosterone acts on mineralocorticoid receptors. So we know that um, aldosterone is um, kind of lipid. So it's, it, it, the aldosterone is able to go inside the cell. And when it goes inside the cells, it will activate a secondary messenger. In our case, it's the, um, in this case, it's the um, messenger um, RNA. So it's playing or changing the RNA of the cell 
So that would lead to protein synthesis. And what does protein synthesis mean? It means more ENAC channels because they are protein channels. So the channels are protein. So the mRNA working, it will increase the suppression of the ENAC channels. So that's um, so in a principal cells, um, this increases the apical potassium conductance and then increases the sodium potassium pump also increases the epithelial sodium channel enac activity all of that because we are um secreting um, potassium to the outside we are um, taking sodium to the inside this will lead to lumen negativity which means this is the lumen so now this part is going to have a lot of um, negative channels and that leads to potassium secretion because we are having so much um, um, negative charge over here we are required to um, get the potassium outside into the lumen just to um, you know compensate for all of these negative charges over here because potassium is positive so if it goes into the urine then it will help reduce the negativity of this of urine because it's positive okay so it will help us reduce these negative charges over here so um yeah that's why we are having a potassium secretion over here uh that's for the principal cells well in the alpha interplated cells this lumen negativity will lead to an increase in hydrogen atpase activity and increase in hydrogen secretion so in the alpha intercalated cell, so in this part, because we also are having um, a lumen negativity that will cause the hydrogen ions to be excreted into the urine. And we know that the hydrogen ions are positive. Ouch. Well. We know that the um, hydrogen ions are positive so whenever they go out their positive charge will help in reducing these um, negative charges of the lumen um, so and of course the hydrogen um, secretion by itself it will lead to um, increased HCO3 and chloride exchanger activity um, also the ADH will work over here and will act on the V2 receptors, uh, that is that will increase, of course, the insertion of aquaparins H2O channels on epithel side, and the UT1 receptors. That's for urinary absorption. Uh, well, we're talking over here. This is what we mentioned before that whenever ADH comes to the V2 receptors, it will increase the expression of aquaporins and it will allow more H2O to flow into um the cell. So over here, um. Uh, we also get some um, urinary absorption and of course as a result um, like a complete end result we get um, um, three to five percent of the sodium back into uh, the blood okay and um, that should be it for the nephron transport physiology so how the renal defects but that's it for now